A Gathering of Days, A New England Girl's Journal, 1830-1832, to A Novel by Joan W. Bloss. Chapter 6 Friday, January 7th, 1831. Cassie, Asa, Maddie, and I walked home from school together. He loudly lamented the great injustice that he must struggle with arithmetic, while Cassie and I, indeed all we girls, are excused by reason of our sex from all but the simplest ciphering and the first four rules. We hoped to go sledding after, but Mr. Shipman had need of Asa, and too soon it was dark. Monday, January 10th, 1831. Last week the teacher read from the paper. Today he set no text. Instead, to improve our penmanship, he bade us each to practice upon lines of our own choosing. The idle fool is whipped at school, was Asa's occasioning laughter. Cassie undertook as hers, sudden and violent passions are seldom durable. I chose, better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. Proverbs 26, 10. Although I chose it to honor Cassie, all the while I worked at it, my mind was with the phantom. Indeed, it seemed a part of me traveled with him across white fields and toward what destination? No, I must stay, I imagined, I cried, but was answered only by the soughing wind. Thursday, January 13th, 1831. Heavy snow these past three days. We are much confined to the house. Today there is so much wind and drifting, we scarce can see the barn. Only the tops of the fence posts show, each one domed with caps of snow, funny and misshapen. Until the road is broken out, for which we must wait till the storm is spent, school will not reopen. Although there is always work to do, yet is it of a different sort. Tis half a day. Tis half a holiday. Today I turned a shirt for father, and instructed Maddie in how to turn a heel. I have shown her this before, but she did not remember. Father, for his part, brought in some wood, nicely seasoned and matched as to grain, with some pieces partially carved. When I inquired what he would make, he said he had gotten to thinking about a chair he started years ago. It was for your mother before she took sick, and never had completed. Friday, January 14th. At midday today, the storm let up. By dusk, a few pale shadows appeared on the hill-locked snow. Father expects that tomorrow will be the day of the breaking out. This time, we may go with him if the weather is not too severe. Monday, January 17th, 1831. This morning, we dressed as warm as we might, turning ourselves into fat, funny bundles Aunt Lucy would not approve. I had on two dresses and a woolen underskirt, topped this with two shirts of father's, and finally my shawl. Maddie complained she could not bend her arms, so thickly layered were her clothes, and Catherine, it itches. Better itch than freeze, I said, and scratched the frost from a window pane that we might observe the road. The house itself was nearly as cold as it was outdoors. We'd hardly wakened the fire this morning only enough to prepare our meal, and now it was already banked to stay till our return. Father had made his way to the barn, redigging the path as he must each day against the swelling drifts. There he'd readied the oxen up and brought them out to wait in the yard, the yard itself reduced by snow with only as much of it cleared each day as we might need to use. This morning the team breathed out great clouds. Father, to benefit by their warmth, placed himself between their bodies, but even so kept moving. It was that cold. Because it hovered over them, we saw the breath of approaching teams before the teams or drivers. Then, at last, they hove in sight. The men, deployed on either side, cast up shovels full as they walked, tossing up snow to cap the drifts, whereby the spray and drift of snow was nearly continual. Behind them sparkled the marble white road. No one smirched upon it yet. The bed and banks were the same pure white. 
a dazzlement to the eye. We saw six teams already in place, Mr. Shipman's being the last. Four more teams were yet to come. With us behind Mr. Shipman, there'd be eleven teams. Twenty-two oxen. More than that in men. We thought we might be to Holderness first, but were chagrined on reaching the bridge that others were there before us. Good-naturedly, they teased and joked, been sleeping, sugaring, or shoveling. And what the answer may have been was lost amidst the laughter and quick new round of jests. Each of the taverns soon overflowed, for if we were not the first to arrive, neither were we the last. From every hill, by every road, came lines of teams and men. The farthest to come was from College Road, the nearest from Shepherd's Hill. Our own lot, line of Coxborough men was neither near nor far. Maddie first spotted our Uncle Jack, our frequent guest in summer months, but whom we see less often in winter, the travel being harder and the days so early dark. Uncle Jack calls the breaking out the closest a New Hampshire winter gets to the 4th of July. Once this day I feared Maddie was lost, but there she came, soon enough, led by a cheerful, if tipsy, stranger, saying cheerfully to me, "'Here's your little one, ma'am.' We stayed till it was long afternoon. The way home, lying mostly uphill, we had a leisurely journey of it, taking our pleasure in the newly cleared road and telling each other the news we'd gleaned during our hours in town. It was nearly dusk when we reached the house, and very cold within. Father brought the fire to life, then went out and, with his axe, hacked off some of our frozen soup that we might start it heating while he attended to chores. A knock at the door told of guests unexpected. It was no other than Teacher Holt who'd stayed behind with this and that, and now was caught in the oncoming dark and still far from his lodgings. Back went Father with his axe, and soon returned to fill the pot with which was quickly bubbling. As pleasant vapors filled the room, I deemed myself amply rewarded for the slow preparation all those weeks ago. To the soup, we joined bread and cider, also nuts and apples. To offset the plainness of the food when we had a visitor, I set out the pewterware and not the wooden bowls. Teacher Holt talks with father now and will stay the night. We have no proper chamber for guests, but he assures us he'll sleep well downstairs by the fire.